it's my pleasure this afternoon to welcome Dr. Eric Hoffman. He is a human geneticist and translational researcher who's focused on neuromuscular disease and skeletal muscle tissue and health and disease. His most recent efforts focus on drug development and clinical trials in Duchenne muscular dystrophy that you'll hear more about this afternoon. He's also co-founder of Riveragen Biopharma, co-founder and vice president of Agata Biosciences, and co-founder and president of Trins LLC. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Hoffman. I will now turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Rick. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, speak you, with you this afternoon, and also to uh, share this, the um, session with uh, Olivia and uh, Jane. Uh, we've known each other for many years now and all towards this goal of starting clinical trials in muscular dystrophy. It's quite a privilege. Um, should I share my screen? Probably. Please. Yes. So just as um, 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 was noted, I'm uh, at Binghamton University, uh, set up a new pharmacy school as part of the state system of New York. And then also just as disclosures have also been involved in three spin-offs from academia. These have also been uh, generally done in collaboration with uh, foundations, nonprofit foundations, including Jesse's journey for, and some of the work I'll speak about today. So what I'll speak about is start with glucocorticoids, prednisone and deflazocort. And uh, this is just a couple quotes from a, a recent review of some scientists from England who are uh, very well known for arthritis studies. And they go over how glucocorticoids like prednisone were first discovered in late 1940s, early 1950, and were quickly given the Nobel Prize. And you know, really the unprecedented ability of glucocorticoids to control inflammation in multiple conditions from RA to systemic, lupus, and now Duchenne, you know, their standard of care was rightly lauded. Uh, and they summarized this whole review of how they're still being used in very important drugs and very effective drugs. And pharmaceutical efforts are ongoing to recapitulate or, or keep the immune modulatory benefits. So keep the efficacy, a uh, good part of glucocorticoids while avoiding the metabolic bone and vascular adverse events. So, so sort of the safety concerns or side effects that come with the, uh, the benefit of glucocorticoids and development of such agents could deliver remarkable future value. So in the outline of this uh, 15 minutes, I'll just basically try to answer that question. Does Vimorolone as a new drug developed first for Duchenne muscular dystrophy fulfill that goal of keeping the immune modulatory by avoiding bone and, and other side effects? And I'll start off with a trial that was just finished this last summer of 121 DMD boys. And I'll try to convince you that it seems yes, that we do keep the uh, an immune modulatory to benefit and then uh, lose some of the side effects. Then I'll briefly just a few slides on what Memorlone is and how it differs uh, or is similar and differs from corticosteroids like prednisone and deflazocort. And then uh, the last few slides I'll talk about next steps. We're starting um, just next month, a, a wide age range trial in Canada only, two to four years, seven to 18 years. And Jesse's journey is supporting this is the major support of this trial. Uh, and also a Becker muscular dystrophy trial uh, that's recruiting in Pittsburgh and Padua, Italy. So this trial that I'll start off with, I'll just jump straight into the results of a trial we recently finished. Um, DMD boys that hadn't been treated with prednisone or deflazocort previously, a young and narrow age range, just four to seven, less than seven years old, but no inclusion or exclusion criteria really beyond that. So it was all comers, as we say. So if you were a, a Duchenne child between four and less than seven and hadn't taken steroids for a long time, you could generally join the trial. Uh, it was at uh, 11 countries, 33 sites, and boys were randomized into four different groups. So it was blinded. We didn't, boys and their physicians, and we didn't know who was given what, but we had a quarter of the boys going on placebo, a quarter going on prednisone, and two do different doses of the Morlone. And we'd had previous data, including um, with Canadian sites and Canadian patients, previously concluded trials that suggested that th these were, um, could be both safe and effective. And then it was a 24 week or six month treatment period. Um, now, just uh, one more piece of background is, this is not a dystrophin replacement. Um, you'll hear about that in the subsequent talks, uh, but it's just to point out that at least it's envisioned currently and probably for quite a while that 
uh, dystrophin replacement efforts are on top of corticosteroids. So because they're not normal dystrophin, they're not bringing back the normal gene or the normal protein, they're semi-functional. So all the trials, and it's in view that in the future, probably all the actual treatments that emerge will be on top of corticosteroids. So our effort is to try to give a better corticosteroid that eventually could be then used in combination with dystrophin replacement. So ideally dystrophin replacement plus anti-inflammatory with less side effects is probably what we're all shooting for in the short term. So this is just the design of the trial, 24 week treatment period, these four groups. I should mention that they did go on where prednisone and placebo went on to bromorlone, still blinded, and that was recently completed as well, but we're still analyzing that data. We haven't unblinded it yet. So I'll just talk about this first six months. Now, how do we test if a drug works? So these are called motor uh, outcome measures. So they're tests that look at um, muscle ability to walk or run or, and the, these are five that are often used in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I'm sure many of you have heard of them. A six minute walk test is walking back and forth in a hospital hallway for six minutes, see how far the child can go. 10 meter run walk, just a short sort of sprint. A four stair climb where all the clinics have the same four stairs in the clinic. North Star, which is 17 different tests on a scale, including hopping on one foot, et cetera. And then stand from supine, which means the child lies back on the floor. And how long does it take to stand up uh, to get to standing? And um, for time tests, we use velocity uh, instead of seconds. So a key thing with clinical trials is you have to choose a primary outcome. In other words, the regulators say, look, we don't want you to pick and choose what you're looking at and which test you're using after the trial is done. You have to pre-specify. You have to say up front what hand of cards you're going to put all your money on, and that's your primary outcome. And so we had to pick one of these five. And so what we did is discuss with parents um, internationally and said, okay, of these different things, climbing stairs, 10 meters, which one do you think is most relevant to your quality of life? And they all agreed that time to stand from supine because I think the imagery of a child falling in the street or at school and unable to get up. And so we're, as far as I know, the first to use this as a primary outcome. Um, and we argued with both Europe and uh, FDA that this would be a good outcome that reflects quality of life and they agreed. So time to stand was our primary outcome. Uh, and we had to pick a single dose um, and we picked the higher dose. I should mention that all these trials were done with the Cooperative International Neuromuscular Research Group or Synergy. And that's a, a, a clinical trial network internationally that's been doing Duchenne studies for about 25 years. So we did do this in the midst of COVID. So that was challenging. Um, and we had to adapt. It turns out that your, our time to stand, which was our primary outcome, could be done remotely. So we worked with um, clinical evaluators, particularly uh, Meredith James in Newcastle, to develop a video time to stand in the patients and family's home. And that worked really well. So we didn't lose any patients due to COVID, even though they couldn't come into the clinic. So the primary was the high dose versus placebo. And then we have what's called sequential secondary outcomes. If we win on this hand of cards, we're allowed to go to the next one, which is the lower dose versus placebo. If we win there, we're allowed to keep on going. So this is what the data looks like. This is your six months and the tests over these 24 weeks or six months. And the, this was all done blinded. So only after the, everybody was done did we unblind it and just see what it looks like. And red is placebo. So we see over this six months that Duchenne kids they're sort of stable. They're declining a bit with time to stand and six minute walk and maybe time to run walk. They're just stable, maybe a little better at the end. But you see with these two doses of Amorolone, they get quite a bit better. So they're improving over this six months. And what I did was mark the primary outcome, which is this high dose. This is the secondary outcome, first one. And that also, you need P less than 0.05. And then here's the second secondary, third secondary fourth, secondary, and fifth. So we got all the way to here, and this one just missed. So you can see that by many of these tests, the more alone clearly at both doses was making the kids' motor outcomes better. Then we also had exploratory outcomes, which is the North Star and the time to climb. And similarly, those both doses showed efficacy or benefit compared to placebo. 
Uh, and this is just a list of the p-values. Now, what about compared to prednisone? Remember, we had prednisone in the same trial. And so prednisone here is blue. And you see that the high dose for moralone, which is this gray, generally does the same. You know, here it's a little on North Star a bit less, but it's a little bit more in time to climb, et cetera, but quite comparable. And here's placebo, again, little weaker or stable. The lower dose, and some is similar, um, but others is a little less than the high dose in prednisone. Um, but it, it depends on the outcome measure. But it seems generally both doses are comparable to corticosteroids. Now, you might just say, if you notice, we're dosing a lot higher. Um, Vomorolone is being dosed much higher, three to nine times prednisone dose. So we have a weaker steroid. We know that. We knew that from the beginning. We have to both dose higher, and I can explain that why we knew that in the end. So we do certainly have a weaker steroid, um, but that's not the important question. The important question is, do we have a safer steroid? Because the whole point is to try to lessen the side effect burden of corticosteroids. So one objective outcome you can look at is bone. As mentioned in that early arthritis um, slides in the beginning, the bone uh, morbidities or safety side effects are quite, um, quite dramatic with corticosteroids. And one way to look at that is just in the blood to see if the bone blood markers, these are called biomarkers, change. And this is a, a biomarker of bone formation. And as you see with all steroids, that plummets after corticosteroids. So you see each of these bone biomarkers in the prednisone groups are going dramatically down. And that's what you expect because you see that whenever you give steroids to any patient of any disorder is their bone biomarkers sort of shut down, their bone stops remodeling. And that can make brittle bone or osteopenia. So you see with prednisone doesn't do much, or placebo doesn't do much, but um, the doses of amorolone don't decrease. If anything, they increase. And that's very different from prednisone. And that matches growth stunting. So you see that even in the six month trial, kids on prednisone were stopping growing. So this classic stunting of growth of any child on any corticosteroid. But if anything, you see the higher dose of amorolone was actually growing quicker. Now, this was interesting. And we saw that also, as I'll show you in long-term studies, if you look at DMD boys be young, when before they take any drug, but more alone or prednisone, they're actually smaller than their peers. They're about the 25th percentile on average than their peers, you know, their classmates. Um, so boys with DMD do have intrinsic growth delay. Um, and what we think is happening is with Vomorolone, we get some catch-up growth. And we do see that happen early and then it stabilizes so they don't keep on growing uh, quicker. Um, but this, again, quite a bit of difference. So that's for six months, what of long-term. Here's after 18 months, or and uh, we've also looked at 30 months. And the same story is that by any studies of corticosteroids, is stunting of growth. Here's from the Deflazacort trial that was used for drug approval in the US. And you see the quite dramatic stunting of growth. All the kids show loss of uh, height, whereas in Vlamor alone, they actually improve growth. What about other side effects? So you can look at sort of um, side effects that are often associated with corticosteroids. And what you see is that there seems to be less. I mean, you see here's uh, prednisone and here's placebo. And it seems like the different doses of amorolone are more towards the placebo than they are towards corticosteroids. So in general, side effects seem to be better. And then in particularly, if we look at behavior, um, here's the rate of behavior uh, side effects. And here's, you, you generally see about half the, um, the uh, behavior problems with Vomorlone um, than you do with corticosteroids. Another one is adrenal insufficiency. And this one gets complicated. Uh, adrenal insufficiency um, doesn't really have any overt symptoms per se. Um, it's when you take corticosteroids, your adrenal glands stop making their own cortisol or endogenous corticosteroid. Um, and, but it does put you at risk for adrenal crisis. So that's where a lot of patients carry cards with them. So we studied that, and this gets a little complicated. I don't want to go over it too much. But one of the things we found is that um, Duchenne kids show adrenal insufficiency at baseline. Um, and Liam Ward and Alex Ahmet and um, uh, Annie 
uh, Sprochi up in Montreal, we're all studying this more. But that was a surprise, an unexpected finding. So all the Duchenne kids, even before we give them any drug, show some adrenal insufficiency quite a bit. Um, if you give then after drug, you see 100% of kids on prednisone show adrenal insufficiency. Um, placebo still shows 20% because of that baseline Duchenne kids that show some adrenal insufficiency. But you see vimorolone does show adrenal sufficiency as well, although at least for vimorolone, the lower dose, it's significantly different than prednisone. It's less adrenal sufficiency. Um, and that's just some more numbers and adrenal insufficiency. What about weight gain? We're seeing similar uh, weight gain between, and it's variable within sub, between subjects uh, on any of these drugs, but it looks not so much different from prednisone. So the summary of the double-blind study is efficacy or benefit. Um, we met the primary and four secondary or finding all, on all five outcomes are quite similar. Uh, DMD placebo stable, um, but it's stable, not an improvement over the so-called honeymoon period. Uh, six mg per kg, a bit better than two mg per kg on some outcomes and the effect size of the moral and similar to prednisone. For bone safety, even more than safer than prednisone, TA moods, it may be safer than prednisone and adrenal insufficiency. The two mg per kg seems to be safer than prednisone, but six mg per kg pretty similar. I just want to thank the physicians and their staff, particularly um, Jean Mann in Canada and also Kathleen Selby and Sprochi and Hugh McMillan um, who participated in this trial. So then for the last few slides, uh, I hope I've convinced you that we do have a drug that in, improves the immune modulatory effects, but avoids at least some of the side effects. I'll just one or two slides on this and then these last two trials. All we did was really change one atom of corticosteroids. This is an oxygen in prednisone and deflazacord in all corticosteroids. And we just took that off and changed it to a hydrogen. And that does change these downstream activities. Um, we had already shown in a previous clinical trial of 48 DMD boys that over six months, we did a large dose ranging. And so we saw that the more dose, higher dose you went, the better the kids generally did. And that's why we dropped these two lower doses and we went forward with the two and six. And now we've gone through 30 months treatment and that paper is written up by Jean Ma and will hopefully be published soon. Um, we also use biomarkers to de-risk the program early on. We can see the CK just drop after two weeks of treatment and even two weeks off treatment, they continue to drop. And inflammatory biomarkers all dose dependent. The more dystrophin you give, the more these biomarkers go down, showing that we have this anti-inflammatory effect. So now to go to these last two slides, um, this is a trial that um, Jean Ma is the uh, chair of Calgary, and we have um, six sites in Canada uh, and nowhere else. It's only being done in Canada. It's this trial is required by the European Medicine Association, or EMA, as part of our pediatric investigation plan. And we have Calgary, Vancouver, Ottawa, Toronto, London, and Montreal. And again, thanks to all these uh, collaborating physicians there, um, seeing the patients. This is 44 participants over a broad age range, two to four and seven to 18. The seven to 18 years can be previously steroid treated or untreated. So how the trial's written is if the boy is treated with corticosteroids, they come into the clinic and the next day they stop the steroids and start from more along. It's just a three month study uh, with just six clinic visits and there's no placebo, all of them are alone treated. And then after the three months, participants, if they wish, can remain on the more long, long term as we already have an expanded access protocol uh, with Health Canada for that covers that. So no additional visits or tests with the expanded, it's just standard of care going to the regular clinic visits. So we hope we try, we work with families to keep this as a low burden on families. And uh, Jean Ma is hoping to enroll her first patient in December, and then the other sites should kick in early next year. And if you're interested in this trial or learning more about it, uh, please contact uh, these physicians. Then this is the Becker trial, a broad age range, 18 to 65, 39 participants. Um, this is funded by the, oh, I should mention this trial is funded by Jesse's Journey. Uh, so they uh, provided a, a million dollar Canadian grant under a venture philanthropy model. and. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we're only doing it in Canada because they, they were very generous in supporting this. And thank you for all of you who support Jesse's journey. Uh, the Becker trial was supported by National Institute of Health and FDA Orphan Grants Program and Foundation Eradicate Duchenne in the US. 
It's 39 participants, six months study, five clinic visits, again, expanded access protocols, low burden on families, and enrolling in Pittsburgh and Padua. And Revirigen covers travel and stay for any of their trials. And Suzanne Gagliannoni, who herself is a pa parent and has participated with her son in many trials, runs her uh, travel and stay. Um, just one last note, we've kept this Vamorlon in the academic space. And so um, it's been run quite differently than many other programs. Um, a lot of leverage of federal resources and programs, uh, high tolerance of risk, um, and extensive engagement of parents, stakeholders, and foundations. Not to say that uh, other pharmaceutical com companies don't do this, uh, many do. Um, and we use this uh, academic clinical trial network synergy. And this le led to a small, flexible, science-driven, responsive team. And like I mentioned in COVID, we were able to keep 100% of subjects in the study and 100% of our primary outcome. So I just want to thank uh, not only Jesse's journey, but all the other foundations and governments that have supported the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, very much. Uh, tremendous presentation. And uh, I know now we will open it up to questions from the families and uh, anyone on, online. Um, the one thing that caught my eye, many things did, but the one in particular was the older boys in the trial, plan for the trial. Um, and uh, I just had a question about that. What, what should their expect, this is a difficult one to answer, I know, but what should the expectations be for older boys who have or have not been on uh, other steroids and so on and so forth? Um, what kind of changes may they see uh, at 16 or, you know, a uh, mid-teens, that type of thing? Well, the, the key reason to run these trials is to answer that question. So up front of the trials, it's, we really can't say. Um, I mean, you can uh, hazard some guesses, but, you know, you really have to run the, the trials in order to get data to, before you can say what's, what's going to happen. Um, you know, certainly with the kids on corticosteroids, they generally have uh, side effects. And we're hoping with uh, Bamorlone um, that those side effects are lessened. We don't know if we're going to reverse them or not, because again, we have to do the trial to, to study that. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question in the chat here for you. Um, in the newest trial starting in 2022, do the seven to 18-year-olds have to be ambulatory? And the second part of the question is, what will the effectiveness outcomes be this time? So in the older kids, no, they don't have to be ambulatory. So it's generally, again, all comers. Um, the, uh, for the older kids, we're using the pull, the, the upper limb um, outcome measure. For the very young kids, we're using uh, Bailey 3, which is a, a, a different scale for very young children. So it, with Duchenne, as you know, you really, the outcome measures change as a function of age. So you have to make sure your trial is using appropriate tests um, that are consistent with the kids at that age. Um, more questions coming in now. Um, in the newest trial, uh, is it going to be based on two or six milligram dose? We're doing both. So okay. um, the first uh, kids enrolled will be on the two migs per kg. Um, where there's an additional thing that's being changed in this new trial is that we've made the previous trials were done with a, a, a liquid citrus flavored formulation that was taken with breakfast and generally it was quite acceptable by families and patients and didn't really get many complaints. I mean, some even adults in phase one said it was yummy. <laughs> um, um, but we, we needed to give it with um, some fat in the morning. So a, a glass of full fat milk or some equivalent that was culturally sensitive. Well, it, it's best if you don't have a food requirement, particularly something that might you know, add to the patient's weight, like full fat milk. Um, so this new formulation, um, gets rid of the food effect. So now it doesn't matter um, um, what you eat, but because it's a new formulation, it's, it tastes the same, it's in the same bottles and everything, but we wanna do the low dose first, just so we can look at drug exposure and make sure it's, we're almost certain it's gonna be exactly the same as the previous formulation, but we just wanna test some kids first. So all the low dose kids will be enrolled at the two mg per kg first, and then the high dose later. But remember, it's three months, and once you go on the expanded access, 
the families can choose with their physicians can choose whatever dose they want. So the expanded access supports anything between two and six. So some opt for six, some opt for two, some opt for four. And that the physician, the family have that flexibility. Thank you. Uh, next question is, can you compare Vimoralone to Deflazacort or have you? Um, no, we've never done a head to head. Um, so, you know, you, anytime you're comparing studies that are not blinded and head to head, so randomized um, within the same trial, then any comparison should be taken very, with a grain of salt. I mean, um, because you really can't count on those um, because of placebo effect, maybe the trials are done differently, et cetera. Um, back when we first designed the trial that just finished, we considered prednisone or the phaser court. But at that time, prednisone was used more extensively in Europe, and we were also going forward with Europe. So we just made the decision at the time to use prednisone. And that looks like it for questions too. So Dr. Hoffman, I want to thank you very, very much um, for taking time today to update us on Memorial Loan. Um, there are, you are expecting additional uh, in results in the uh, later this year or new year. Is that, is that a fair question or? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we you, have that, any idea of timing? Well, we have that 48 week uh, uh, study and that's being um, compared to the four DMD study, which also many in Canada participated in. Uh, run by Birch Griggs and um, Michaela Guglieri and Kate Bushby. Um, so that, again, that data is being locked. It hasn't been unblinded yet, but soon in the new year, we expect. Great. Well, again, thank you so much on behalf of uh, Jesse Journey and the families. Keep up the great work and uh, we will certainly be in touch. Thanks. Have a good day. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll move on now to, uh, to our next presentation. Uh, we're very thrilled and delighted to have uh, the caliber of individuals uh, for our forum today. Uh, we have Dr. Danos joining us and uh, Dr. Danos is the Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer of Regenex Bio. Dr. Danos is a pioneer in the field of gene therapy, has dedicated his career to advancing the use of this technology to develop life-saving therapies for patients. And Dr. Danos, uh, I know we've spoken before, uh, the work is very exciting. We uh, and the families here in Canada are, are most anxious to hear what you have to say. So Without any further ado, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, and, and, and thanks to Jesse's journey to give me the opportunity to uh, join you and, 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 and discuss our, our recent data at Regenex Bio on gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So should I share my screen maybe or? Yes, please. Yeah, hold on, I hope. All right. Can you confirm that this is successful or? It is successful. Okay. And now I'm going full screen, see okay? It looks good. All right, thank you. So we're developing a, a, a gene therapy approach for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, those are my forward looking statements that I need to show you because Regenex Bio is a, is a public company. Um, just uh, want first to take you through a couple of slides to introduce Regenex Bio. We are a gene therapy company and we're leaders in the use of uh, adeno-associated virus, AAV vectors for, for gene therapy. The company was founded uh, 12 years ago and it was founded around the uh, uh, the intellectual property, a, 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 a technology platform coming out of uh, UPenn on uh, new uh, types of uh, AAV vectors that, uh, uh, that, that, that with, with, with the enhanced uh, uh, properties for gene therapy. We're headquarters in Rockville, Maryland. Um, and uh, uh, again, our, our, this technology platform allows us to uh, develop vectors for a number of different uh, therapeutic fields. And, and that, that includes, of course, the your muscular field and, your, and, and, and muscular dystrophies. Uh, we have uh, in-house research and development. We have manufacturing capabilities, and we have obviously clinical development capabilities also. So we are fully integrated. And uh, 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 one, one of the reasons why we chose um, two and a half, three years ago to uh, join the the, the 
<clears throat> the development of the, the, the busy field of uh, gene therapy for, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy is because we believe we have a, a, a unique setup for developing these uh, gene therapies, including manufacturing at the commercial scale, uh, stage, the scale, sorry. So uh, this is uh, basically the, 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 the prototype, the, ve the, the vector that we are developing. Uh, this is an AAV vector. What you, you see depicted here the, uh, is the structure of the recombinant genome that has a microdystrophin that is a shortened dystrophin that's been shortened because the whole coding sequence for the dystrophin protein doesn't fit in an AAV vector. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the scientists for uh, more than 20 years have been working at uh, designing those microdystrophins to uh, enable them to fit into AV vectors. And we've, we came up with our own brand of our, our own design. I'll get back on the details of that. We uh, have this sequence for the protein, the therapeutic protein, uh, under the control of a, a muscle-specific promoter that, that we call SPC512. Uh, this is a promoter which allows for transcription, specifically in the skeletal muscle and the heart. And we package this recombinant AAV vector genome into a capsid, uh, which is an AAV8 capsid. So the serotype of the capsid we use is AAV8, which is also different from the other serotypes used uh, in, the, in, the, in the development of, of clinical gene therapies for DMD currently. Um, so we, we, we did a lot of work that I'm not going to detail on the, the, the the, the assembly of this microdystrophin and the optimization of the vector, some of the property that we were uh, <coughs> careful to, to, to optimize were, um, uh, we, 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 we used a special ways to encode the transgene, uh, avoiding uh, abundance of uh, CPG denucleotides because there are signals for the innate immune system and uh, uh, if you can deplete your transgene from this dinucleotide, it confers a number of advantages in terms of minimizing the immune response. Uh, we also optimize the, 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 the coding by codon optimization. Um, and we included, importantly, and that's also a differentiation from other programs uh, around, we included uh, a larger portion of the cytominal domain uh, of, of, of the dystrophin protein. This is what's on, the, on this next slide here, <clears throat> where you see uh, on the left, a picture, a, a cartoon that shows you the, 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 the way dystrophin as a protein is organized with a, uh, an entomidal domain that binds to the cytoskeleton, a spectrin-like repeat domain, which is multiple, multiple repeats here that, 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 uh, that, 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 that goes all the way to the pseudomidal domain. The pseudomidal domain is uh, where a protein of the, the dystrophin associated complex binds the protein and, and, and binds the, the and, and associate with the cell membrane. Uh, so currently, microdystrophins that are used in the clinic do contain a part of the pseudomidal domain because this is absolutely uh, needed for, 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 the, for, the, for the formation of this important complex. But they're missing uh, some of it, and they're missing some of it because uh, it's been shown to be dispensable for having some activity. But uh, it's also, we, we, we decided to try to include it because we thought that uh, we could find, uh, we, could, we could have a number of benefits uh, uh, doing that. Uh, that includes a better binding of syntrophins, and syntrophins are adapters that allow for a number of different proteins that includes uh, the, 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 the neural enosynthase, for instance, but, but many others, to aggregate uh, at the, at, at, uh, around this, uh, the dystrophin associated complex and fulfill a number of uh, very different functions that includes uh, signal transduction, that includes uh, calcium homeostasis, et cetera. So we found a way to extend this C terminal, and this is how our uh, microdystrophin is designed. So I'm going to show you some of the preclinical studies that we did using the MDX mouse model, uh, where we uh, tested the, 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 the the potency and the activity of our, of our vector. So it, it, 
but in a, in a nutshell, uh, we, we, we've demonstrated that we can, with using this vector, transduce the muscle in these animals at very, at very high levels. It's a very important vector, and we get a lot of activity of this uh, expression of dystrophy in the skeletal muscle in the heart, and I'll show you that. Um, uh, we also have evidence for complete DAPC recruitment and amelioration of the pathology. So I'm going to go through this uh, in my next slides. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, assays for muscle strength uh, on, the, on, on the two uh, left panels. And on the right panels, there is an analysis of uh, the gait of the animals analyzed at 12 weeks. Uh, the strength uh, is either grip strength, that, that's an in vivo assay where we measure the, 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 the amount of uh, strength of the, of the animal by having it uh, holding a little uh, handlebar and, 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 and pulling. Um, and uh, you can see here that MDX in orange, uh, that is the, 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 the model, the, un, the untreated model, uh, has a reduced uh, uh, strength compared with the uh, white bar, the white bar being the, 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 the normal uh, animals with a fully, fully functional dystrophy. And by treating with our RGX202, our, our, our effect AV8 vector with the macro dystrophy, uh, we can in this assay recover uh, the, the force. Same in the, if we measure the specific force in the isolated muscle, uh, we also recover uh, most of it uh, after treatment with our vector. Interestingly, we, we, we've, we've uh, developed a, an assay for gait analysis here, and that, that we've used this assay in our, in our experiments, and we show that, uh, uh, again, uh, starting with an MDX control, with a, which, has, which has a high score, meaning that the, the, the gait is uh, highly uh, abnormal compared with the, with the with, uh, uh, with, 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 with a normal control. Uh, we see that in a, in a dose response manner, we can recover uh, normal levels of, uh, of, of, of gain here with our treatment. And this is 12 weeks after dosing. Uh, in the next slide, we see uh, the micro expression in the muscle, which has been quantified on this graph, uh, gastrocnemius, diaphragm, and a heart, uh, again, Dose response that you see with increase, increasing doses of the vector, we get uh, increasing amounts of the dystrophy, of the micro dystrophy, sorry. Uh, and that, that reaches actually pretty high levels at the high dose in, in, the, in the heart. Uh, this is something that actually we, we also want to monitor because, uh, uh, of course, we want to have you know, enough protein, but uh, we, we can, at some point, when you start expressing too much protein, there might be eventually issues. Uh, but uh, in, in this case, <laughs> so far, we haven't seen any toxicity in our animal models uh, with these levels of expression of microdystrophy. So this is the effect, one example of what we see at, the, at the, the histology level when we look at the way the muscle is affected by the disease and eventually can be corrected by the, the transfer of the micro, and expression of the microdystrophy. Uh, on the on the the most uh, left panel, you see a, a, a picture of the diaphragm of these animals, uh, healthy control in MDX, where we stain for fibrosis in blue. Uh, we see a very large accumulation of fibrosis uh, here at uh, twelve weeks uh, uh, in the in the in the control, uh, and when we those the animals with increasing doses from one to four increasing doses, we see progressively that we can uh, get rid of most of the fibrosis and recover the picture, which is pretty much like the wild type. So um, other type of assay that we, that we of, of, of endpoints that we measured where it were uh, the, 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 the actual amount of uh, dystrophic tissue that you can image by using MRI. Uh, and uh, this is what's seen on this uh, picture in the, the left panels. Uh, in, in the MDX, <coughs> in the MDX uh, that, that, that the control, you can see that uh, 
you can see a, a number of white zones, which are which represents uh, accumulation of uh, water in the tissues and and uh, and uh, they, 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 their signature of uh, dystrophy. And those white zones that we can spot and quantify also disappear in a dose dependent uh, manner when we treat the animals with RGX202. And this is seen here six weeks on the top row and 12 weeks at the on the on the on the on the lower on the bottom row uh, and uh, on on the right this is just quantification of these uh, images so again something that gives us an idea of our minimal effective dose and in, in this uh, in, in in these animals and this is something this is based on this data that we are now proposing uh, a a a, a when I'm about to file an IND and proposing a design for clinical trial. Um, so that's where we are. Again, I, I told you about the way we've optimized microdystrophy and we've, uh, we've uh, 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 executed on a, on a, on a preclinical package. And that includes uh, the mouse data that I showed you, but we also run toxicology studies pharmacology toxicology studies on, on uh, non-human primates. And again, we have a very clean profile and a good uh, gene transfer efficacy with our vector in the non-human primates. So that's all good news for uh, the next move, which is you know, uh, first in human uh, uh, that we plan to happen uh, next year after we submit the IND by the end of this year. So this is where we are. Uh, obviously part of the whole Preclinical and now clinical development will, could not be done without uh, engagement with the community. Uh, that's why we you know, think that this, is, this kind of interaction that we're having today with Jesse's journey is something uh, very important. And I, I thank you for your attention. Danos, thank you so much for this uh, exciting presentation. Great. Uh, and we will allow time for questions just after one more presentation, and then we will have uh, time. Uh, if you would uh, mind uh, just waiting to see if, if uh, you could feel those questions uh, in just a few minutes. Okay. Um, so thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Danos. Um, and then we're now moving to uh, our, our last speaker of the afternoon, and that is, uh, is Dr. Jane Larkendale. Uh, Dr. Larkendale uh, has uh, recently uh, being promoted uh, and appointed vice president of the clinical science at PepGen. Uh, she is a molecular biologist. Her work has translated research from discovery through to clinical development to the market. And uh, we are looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say this afternoon, Dr. Lockendale, and welcome. Great to see you again. Great. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I'm really excited to be talk talking to such a great group of people and be on such a wonderful panel. So thank you very much. I'm just getting my slides started and then I'll get, go get going. So PepGen is a relatively new company compared to some of the others who have been presented in this, um, in this meeting. But we have what we think is some really exciting research going on. We're working on oligonucleotides. And I'll tell you a little bit about what they are. And we, while we're still very much in the preclinical space, as Regenix has just told you, we are hoping to be in the clinic soon. Okay, can I, next slide. Uh, these are the standard disclaimers everybody has to show, so we'll move straight on. I thought I'd include this slide um, at the beginning, because although I'm sure most of you are very aware of what exon skipping um, drugs do, I think it's important to understand that, to understand how what we're doing is a step beyond what others have done. So our oligonucleotides are small pieces of nucleic acid that cause exon skipping. As you all know, in people with Duchenne, you have a mutation. So if this was the dystrophin gene, the sentence here, the mad cat ate the big rat and the fat bat, a mutation is present, which basically take, takes out a small piece of that. And after the mad cat ate the, you get all nonsense thereafter. Exon skipping drugs, and this includes many others in development as well as our own, will take out a little bit more of that gene. So instead of having nonsense, we have the mad cat ate the fat bat. Now we've obviously lost a small piece amount of information there, but it now makes sense and the rest of the protein can be produced. Um, and the people given, given these exon skipping drugs can therefore produce some dystrophin. So these oligonucleotide drugs get delivered and the patient gets some dystrophin. The challenge with all of these drugs, the challenge that we at PEPGEN are trying to resolve, is that not very much of, um, of this drug gets to where it needs to go. So although these exon skipping drugs are incredibly effective, 
Um, we don't get enough into the places we need them to really see huge amounts of dystrophin. And that's what we've tried to resolve. So we've added um, so peptide is a small, tiny piece of protein to the end of that oligonucleotide, which means instead of delivering a small amount of the oligo, we're delivering huge amounts of the oligo to the places where people with Duchenne need to produce dystrophin. So that's the ethos behind what we're trying to do. With um, our, my colleagues, and I would love to say I was involved with it, but this, has been, this is work that's been going on at the University of Oxford and the University of Cambridge um, in the UK for 10, 15 years, have really been working on developing these peptides, these little bits of protein, to make sure that they're really good at del delivering the oligonucleotides to where they need to be and, uh, and are not toxic. The early generations of these peptides had uh, caused a lot of problems to the kidney, so they weren't suitable as drugs. But they finally, after a lot of, of work, painstaking, uh, looking at the chemistry of these peptides, came up with peptides that are both really good at delivering oligonucleotides, but also safe. So that's what we are looking at now at Peptide. We have licensed these in and, and we're developing them. Our lead program is in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we know that in, in Duchenne, we need to deliver not just to skeletal muscle. We always think of, think of Duchenne as a muscle disease, and it is. But we also know that other, other parts of the body are affected. Smooth muscle, your digestive systems are involved. The diaphragm and breathing are involved. The heart, which eventually result, results in cardiomyopathy and heart failure. And in some cases, as Dr. McAdam McD McD was saying in the last session, the brain as well. Dystrophin is everywhere. And we want to be able to deliver our drugs to all those systems so that we can really change the, the phenotype of people with Duchenne um, and help them in many, many different ways. So I'm now going to transition to actually showing you some data. And don't worry, I'm not going to show too many graphs and charts and go into too much detail. But what we have here is the amount of, our, of oligo that's being delivered to different tissues. This is in a non-human primate, in a monkey, at three different doses. So you can see in the biceps, that's an arm muscle, the gastroc and quad, those are leg muscles. We're getting a lot of oligo at all three of those doses. The diaphragm, which affects your breathing, again, huge amounts. But even in the heart, we're getting huge amounts of oligo in. Again, really important for Duchenne patients. The duodenum and esophagus, those are smooth muscle parts of the digestive system, huge amounts. And we're even getting some into, um, into the brain. Now you can see these levels are much lower and we're still trying to optimize the delivery to the brain. We're not getting as much as we would like, but we are still getting significant amounts of oligo even across, across the blood brain barrier and into the brain. So that, it was this data that made us really excited about our delivery system. And it's a delivery platform that we can deliver um, all kinds of oligonucleotides. But being able to deliver oligo is not the same thing as being able to deliver um, to actually produce dystrophin. So we went on, and this again, just like in the last slide, this is a single dose into a monkey. So they were only given one injection. And I haven't shown you all the data. I only have a couple of different skeletal, mus um, skeletal muscles, the diaphragm and the heart. But again, you can see after a single dose in these non-human primates, we're getting a good amount of exon skipping. Um, it's uh, certainly in the muscles, slightly higher doses to get it into the heart at high levels. But remember, this is a single dose. And we, we would anticipate dosing multiple times. We've actually got that data. I haven't included it in the presentation to show that that 40 to 50% exon skipping, say, say in the um, tibialis anterior, after multiple doses goes up to more like 90%. So over time, we'd expect more exon skipping and we'd expect, therefore, more dystrophin. I can't show you data on dystrophin because this is being done in non-human primates that don't have Duchenne, so we can't actually show increases in dystrophin, but absolutely... We, are, we, we can see high amounts of exon skipping, which we would expect to translate to dystrophin once we move into humans. So where are we now? This is a, the program I've been showing you data for is for EDO51, our exon 51 skipping drug, which is our lead um, product. It's currently in the toxicology studies that are required before we can go into patients. And that will be going into the clinic in Canada in healthy volunteers in the first half of next year. And that'll be our first clinical application. It is healthy volunteers, not people with Duchenne. But by the beginning of next year, we hope to be in, in people with Duchenne and that will be a more global trial. For, close on the heels of video 51, we have a program of myotonic dystrophy and we also are looking at additional of exons for Duchenne behind that. So we recognize that 50, exons 51 skipping will only affect some patients or only be able to be used in some patients but we absolutely are intending to uh, develop the, these therapies, if successful, for as many people as, as we can. So that's where we are right now. We are, as I mentioned, a, a relatively early stage company. We're still a private company, but we are very much a committed member of the Duchenne community. 
Um, as Eric so kindly mentioned at the beginning of his talk, I personally have been involved in Dushan for the, really the last 20 years in various capacities. And as a company, we're really committed to engaging with the community in any way we can. We want you to understand what we're doing, but equally importantly, we want to hear from you what's important to you. As we're beginning to develop the next trial, which over the next year we will be, we really want to understand from you what would make you join a trial, what would put you off joining a trial, how do we make that trial as easy as possible for you to take part on, what your priorities are in a therapy. So really, this drug and our future drugs, we can develop in a way that's most productive for you, the community living with Duchenne, and make it as easy as possible for you to take part in our work. So we're really interested in hearing from you. That's my personal email address at the bottom there. And I really do mean reach out to me. I'm happy to engage at any, any point. We are involved in a lot of pre-competitive space projects and with a number of advocacy groups, including Jesse's Journey, which is doing a fabulous job, um, not only with this meeting, but in general. So please do reach out to me if, um, if you have any questions, suggestions, or thoughts. And just to summarize at the end, what we believe we have in this enhanced delivery oligonucleotide platform is the ability to deliver oligonucleotides to all the key tissues that are important for Duchenne. We're seeing high levels of exon skipping. We're seeing a good balance between activity and tolerability. And we're looking at moving forwards with a once per month dosing regime for this drug. We're anticipating having two different Duchenne therapies in the clinic by the end of 2023. And we'll be following up with the additional Duchenne subgroups over time. And at the same time, our discovery team is working on getting even better delivery to the heart and the brain. I think the, the first generation, we will have enough delivery to the heart. The brain is questionable, and we are actively working on improving that with our next generation peptides. So thank you. I'm always excited to talk to the Duchenne community. I've worked with you for so, so many years and so many capacities. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, Dr. Larkendale, thank you so much. Uh, that was a lot of information and, and, uh, and, and most encouraging information as well. Uh, we have some time now for questions. We'd ask uh, Dr. Danos to, to, uh, to join us. Uh, we are, are going to take the last uh, 10 minutes or so here for some questions that have come in. And Nicola Worsfold, uh, who is also part of our staff, is, uh, is standing by when they get uh, uh, too technical for me, and that won't take much, I'm afraid. But uh, uh, thank, thank you both for, for I think, uh, keeping your presentations uh, to, to a lay level and, and clear understanding of what it is we're trying to accomplish, which is the key thing. Uh, love to hear the news about Canada, too. It's, it's just great. Uh, Dr. Danos, there was a question that came in the chat. Uh, uh, will you accept all mutations for your trial? Um. You know, this is something we've obviously recently considered in the in the light of uh, adverse event that was seen in the clinic and the reactions of other you know, uh, companies developing gene therapy that exclude some of the patients because of uh, of their uh, specific mutation that may may put them more at risk of an immune response. And this is probably something we're going to do as well, although you know we're still finalizing that. Uh, those, I mean, the, the, it means that uh, that uh, patients with mutations in the in in the very beginning of the of the gene of the protein coding coding sequence uh, may end up being excluded. This is a minority of patients, but it, I mean, some of these patients, at least in this you know very first trial where we're going for is this a phase one two right, and we want to put everything on our side to be able to demonstrate safety. Uh, so that that that's that's the that's in in this first phase we would probably exclude some of them. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dr. Dr. Larkendale, for you, the EDO uh, can the EDO peptides work for all kid kinds of mutations for kids with any kind of mutation? I, think, I know you touched on this, but but could you just clarify that? Sure. Yeah. Maybe I wasn't clear. I know I, I, I talk fairly quickly. So our, our lead compound, EDO51, is appropriate for people whose mutations can be fixed by skipping exon 51. And then we will continue with other, um, other exon skipping oligos, though with the same peptide with different oligos that are appropriate for different groups of mutations. The literature suggests that about 80% of, of people with Duchenne are, um, have mutations that can be skipped with, by skipping one exon or another, the, but our lead compound would only address about 13% of the total population. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're start, starting with the big groups and working our way, way down as we get more safety data is the plan. Well, would, uh, the, the other question, of course, always uh, for the Duchenne families is time, timing. 
Uh, should this, and, and this may not be a fair question, but, uh, but the question is, you know, should this be successful in Exxon 51? What is the, what is the timing to apply it to, to the others uh, in order to, and I know that's, that's a difficult question, I'm sure. It's a really difficult question because, of course, it just depends if we blow it out of the park and see massive amounts of dystrophin, we'll be able to move forwards more quickly than if we see sm small amounts, only slightly better than existing drugs and such like. But our plan, as I, I showed on the slides, is we should get Exxon 51 into the clinic next year. We should get Exxon 53 skipping it the following year if all goes well. And then we'll follow up with others. And we have various ideas about how we can then accelerate as we get to the rarer, rarer exons where there are simply fewer numbers of people. And once we have a solid safety database, we can't commit to any of that. But we're really looking into how we can then accelerate once we've got good safety data in a few populations. And that remains to be seen how the regulators will see that. Great, Dr. Larkendale, thank you. And uh, Dr. Dennis, another question that's come back to you, again, dealing with timing. And I know these are difficult questions to answer, but um, based on the, uh, the encouraging results you've had to date, what is the timing for your next steps? Well, the, the, the very next step is within weeks. Uh, before the end of this year, we will uh, file an IND. Uh, and, and if everything goes well with our filing, we, we hope to be able to include a first patient in our trial uh, in the first half of next year, right? Uh, so that that's really it. Then then we run a trial that will uh, that 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 you know will, will follow up patients for uh, one year altogether. So the trial will take about two years to complete, uh, and 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 then move on into a phase three. So that that you know before before we 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 reach uh, the market with an eventual product, we're talking about multi years where, where we are today. But uh, we are definitely uh, moving forward with an IND filing uh, very shortly. Okay, wonderful. And, uh, you know, in the interest of timing, that, that, uh, those are the questions we've had this afternoon. And I, I want to just thank you so much for being part of this forum. Uh, we've been able, through people giving generously of your time, like yourselves, uh, to, to provide information that otherwise is so difficult for families to find and gather. And uh, I think, you know, by putting it all in, in, in one spot, it's been very, very helpful. So, Thank you again so much, uh, Dr. Larkendale, Dr. Danos, and uh, Dr. Hoffman uh, for participating in this segment and providing the updates that you have. And I do appreciate the fact that you're very realistic. If it's early days, we're saying it's early days. We know that in some of the treatments mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But I think, you know, uh, the questions are always going to come from the families on what timing and uh, understandably so. But I think, you know, we, we, the, the real reality is that, uh, that we are some years away from some of these, but uh, still very encouraging preliminary results. So again, uh, thank you, uh, one and all. Uh, we have a, a note uh, from, from one of the chats. These presentations are a great service to the DMD community, and they're just thanking you for, uh, for your participation. That's from the Shen Mom. So uh, again, uh, we will wrap up on that note, and, uh, and thank you all for taking time out of your uh, insanely busy schedules to be part of our Defeat to Shen Family Forum. Thank you very much.